she uh, was telling me, when I say friend, folks, she's a business acquaintance. Uh, she was uh, telling me that they had had a foot of snow and looked like they were going to have another foot of snow. And I said, well, I won't tell you what the temperature is down here in North Carolina. But today has been a beautiful day, and I trust that you have been able to enjoy it. Miss Sheila's not home tonight. She's not feeling well. She has a headache. So remember her in prayer. Tracy is still having a very difficult time with her back. And remember her in prayer as well. And then continue to pray for others in our church uh, as we wait for Miss Shirley to see Dr. Reed again in April. Continue to pray for Gracie and the fact that she has POTS and uh, pray for her and Diana and Roy and the family. Uh, sometimes this becomes very unnerving for everyone. Uh, and so just remember them in prayer. Uh, Miss Brenda's father-in-law fell and... Um, Stepfather fell, uh, yeah, stepfather fell, and um, uh, pray for him as well. Didn't break anything, just just had a, just a tumble. So remember him in prayer as well. And let's continue to pray for our missionaries, uh, Miss Wah, Brother Peter, Dr. Martin. Uh, continue to remember those in prayer and uh, those pastors in Zimbabwe and those pastors that are in Ghana. Remember those in prayer as well. And then, if you notice tonight, we have new lighting under the carports and the entranceways. Also, if you have a key to the church, you can, unless you were given one tonight, you can discard it. Uh, we've had the whole building rekeyed uh, this week because everybody knew where the key was and how to get into church. And... Um, if you need to get into church, please see me, Danny, or uh, Bobby. We can get you in, uh, and then uh, we're going to take and hide a key, uh, but we we can we need to hide it where nobody knows where it's at, but just a few of us uh, that need to get in. So that has been done. These are some things that we needed to do. We've never had the church rekeyed since we've been here, and... Um, and so, and it used to be we have, and we do had a key hid under the carpool, but now everybody can see it. And we've got all these new houses that are going up and certainly don't mean to imply anything, but we just felt like that it's time for us to tighten up on security a little bit, things that are going on, and uh, make sure that we can protect the church as, as well as we possibly can. All right, is there anything I forgot to mention tonight? All right. Father, we thank you tonight that you love us. We thank you for the privilege of being here tonight, Lord. Father, in many nations around the world tonight, um, people can't go to church. If they go to church, their life is in jeopardy. If they go to church, they have to go underground. But God, thank you that we still have freedom in America to come to worship you and to serve you. God, remember these dear people that we have already mentioned tonight. We pray for Miss Sheila. We pray for Miss Shirley, Tracy, others in our church that have physical needs. We certainly do remember Miss Gracie at this time, and we ask that you would undertake for her, give the doctors wisdom, be with Roy, Diana. I know that this is a difficult time for them, and we do pray that you would meet their needs. And dear Lord, we pray for Miss Wan, the work there in Zimbabwe, and those 12 to 13 national pastors. And Lord, it's just not that that country is destitute of food and destitute of finance. Uh, Lord, it is a dangerous place. And uh, even their grandson, you providentially uh, kept from a 12 foot python, a god that had gotten into his bedroom. Lord, ever danger, ever present, all the time. And then, Lord, not only those in Zimbabwe, those in Ghana, God, your people around the world tonight, there's a lot of persecution of Christians tonight that we don't talk about, we don't mention much. And God, even in our nation, our nation is in deep trouble spiritually. And there's only a remnant, Lord, of your people and we ask that you would bless your people. God bless our study tonight. Remember us, Lord, for good. 
be with the little ones in the back as they study. We thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you how you've kept us. And we ask your blessings upon us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight, I want to start winding down maybe two or three more um, lectures on the mind, thought, imagination. I have hesitated to deal with some of the things that I have studied because the, the mind is truly a very powerful thing. And we have come to a place in the world today where man wants to come to Godhood. Now, folks, that's just not some statement that some pastor is making. Um, there are many institutions worldwide that are working to bring man to Godhood. But there is one difference between God and man, many, but God can create. Man cannot. Man might be able to make things, but man can't create. But man is striving to come to, again, Godhood. And I'm going to make that with a little d because man will never do it. But man wants to be his own God. And I could go on and on with this study because we're taking it out of the Bible. And the Bible has a lot to say about the mind. I want to go back for just a moment to Lucifer. This is very important. I go to, I've gone to him, and a lot of this is going is redundant. I know that. But please stay with me because I want you to think about this when you are not here. I want you to practice thinking on God because what we truly need to come to as God's people, especially in the hour in which we live, is meditation. Are we able to meditate on the things of God without all of the things of the world coming in and invading our thoughts on meditating on God? We need to learn to meditate on God at work. We need to learn to meditate on God at school. We need to learn to meditate on God in any fellowship or any activity that we are doing. It is that which will bring the mind to a rest. There are a lot of new age thinking today. And we've looked at this word, psychosomatic. It's a word that is given by psychologists and psychiatrists, and it deals with the mind and the body. We need to ask this question. Is the mind so powerful that it can take over the body? Is the mind so powerful, and this really becomes the greater question, is the mind so powerful that it can take over the soul. Now, normally, we don't sit around and think about things like that. 30, 20, 30, 40 years ago, we didn't hear about a lot of people having nervous breakdowns. We didn't hear a lot about mental health. We didn't hear about all of these things that children have today whether it's attention, attention disorder or whatever, and I don't know all the acronyms and so forth. But we didn't hear that. When I was in school, I never heard that. Um, I've often thought if these things were 
proactive when I was in school, good night, how I would have been labeled on many things. But it was life, and you had to overcome it. But now we have come to a place in society where those are not the way things are dealt with. But Lucifer has a mind. And Lucifer, could, can, he influenced a third of the angels. Now, folks, we may think that's no big deal or we may kind of pass over that. But I'm telling you, if Lucifer influenced a third of the angels, and when did Lucifer come to the point I can take over God or I can become God or greater than God and we're going to say Isaiah 14 that is true but and we can go to Ezekiel 28 but when we look at this a third of the angels followed Lucifer so what does that tells me something else about an angel an angel has a will he an angel can make a decision and then the other third that did not fall, the two-thirds that did not fall, they had a will. They chose to follow God. But angels are different than men. But yet men have will. They have conscience. They have emotions. We talked about this multiplicity of times. They have a mind. But folks, this is very important that I begin to understand it because this is where this is where we're going in the world today. And what brought this in? And I gotta go back and deal with this briefly. Existentialism. Now, I remember the very first time I can I can I can go to the place where I was sitting right now when the first time I heard existentialism. And I thought, what in the world is this? And then in the lecture, I heard it explained. I left. I still didn't know what it was. And it took me a long time. I can, get, I can get the definition. But it took me a long time to come to understand what truly existential is or was. Well, it is, rather. Get my things right here. What is it? Well, what has happened is when we come to existentialism, we have no absolutes. And you're going to say, Preacher, how many times are you going to say it? I don't know. I, I, I don't know how many times I'm going to say it. But that's just important because now we have no absolutes. Well, if we have no absolutes, then we can have no truth. And what happens to truth when there's no absolute? There's no reality. And last week I took and I dealt with fantasy role play. Now, folks, there's some things about fantasy role play I won't tell you about. I, and I don't want to get into it because it is of the occult. It is demonic. Now, here we got a little girl. Here we have a little boy. The little girl likes to get out her teacup, saucers, her little table. My sister had one and pretend they're having a tea party. Play with the dolls. That's normal. I have pretended as a little boy to do certain things. I distinctly remember one time I talked to my dad about imagination. And I was a grown man. And I asked him. We were alone one day. And I said, Daddy, I said, let me ask you a question. I said, do you ever imagine things he says yes I said no no I mean do you ever play role imagine things he says I do he says but you got to keep it normal because with me I can imagine anything I can imagine being a doctor 
I can imagine being a jet pilot. I can imagine being a preacher. I used to preach on bells of hay when I was a little boy. I had a vivid imagination. But folks, what we're seeing today young people have in imagination is not the norm. It's just not that you're having a little play. Matthew would probably kill me for this. But Matthew and I play a little game. You know, he's a junior firefighter. And so he gives me little scenarios. And, and he appoints me my task. And we play this game. We laugh. We have a good time. He, you know. But you know what? That's not the reality. I know that and he knows that. But we have young people today that have no concept of what true reality is because they have been brought up with no absolutes. They have been brought up with no truth. They have no biblical background, and the only place that we can find truth, folks, is the Bible. That's the only place. And we can have this attitude, we're going to grow out of it. Don't you count on it. Now we've got fantasy role play that adults, and like I say, I won't even get into the depths of it. And I don't need to study it. I can't study it but so much, but I have to leave it alone anyway. But folks, when you have no absolute and you have no truth and you have no reality, then you will have no right and no wrong. You will have no morals. And this is when we now seek to come to Godhood. Because what happened? Technology now is taking over. AI is taking over. And you can begin to just simply read articles now about I was talking to someone today, and I, and I kept using AI. And they finally said to me, what do you mean by AI? I says, artificial intelligence. And this is a big push in, on, with the World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization. They're pushing this very heavily now because they want man to become to come to Godhood. And I have found something in my study that absolutely fascinates me. They don't like evolution no more. They might talk about it, but they don't like it. And you know why they don't like it? Because it's not moving fast enough. Man's too slow. Man has got to get to Godhood through technology, artificial intelligence, this is where he's got to get so that we can mark out God and God is no longer needed. And there is a Jewish scientist that I have referred to several times in this study. His view is all religions have to go, especially Christianity, for man to come to Godhood. And that is his goal and that's what he's pushing for. And so existentialism brought it in. Then psychologists and psychiatrists came up with the term psychosomatic, which is the mind and the body. But now we have come to a new consciousness. You can Google this and you'll get a boatload of articles. This is where man wants to go now. This is where he wants to become when he comes to God. Who This is self. What can I be? Can I be greater than God? Now, you're not going to find many people that will make that statement, but you're going to find a whole lot of people that live that way. And the Lord is going to warn us about these things. And I want to take some passages tonight and go through them quickly and bring out this new consciousness and what the Lord has to say about it. 
And one of the keys to this is going to be deception. Let's just take deception for a moment. All of you over the last two to three weeks have heard about these so-called balloons that China is sending across the United States and their weather balloons. Well, we don't know what they are, really. They, they have no clue. And if they do know, they're not telling us. And I would probably uh, lay hold of the latter. But here again, what is it that they want us to do? It, they want it to be a deception. And I tell you this all the time. You've got to come, you've got to, come to a point now. What I'm looking at, I've got to understand, that's not what I'm seeing. It's what they want me to see, but it's not what I'm seeing. Ukraine becomes, has become of the last several months or since the Biden administration, it has become a straw man. They don't give a fig about Ukraine. Ukraine becomes the epic center for what they're trying to do. And thousands of innocent people have died. Ethnic groups are being purged. And it's not a Russia, Ukraine, China, U.S. deal. And if you study it very carefully, and I want to stay out of the political of it, but the United States forced Putin's hand. Now, I don't have no use for Putin. He's a communist. He's wicked. He's evil. He headed the KJV. But he was pressed, pressed, pressed. And the Ukraine has always been one of the most corrupt countries in all of the world. But the Ukraine is going to become the center of the rebuilding is of what is called a new consciousness lifestyle. And they're going to use the term smart cities. Now, this is important because they are not going to want you 15 minutes from your house so that they can track and trace you. China don't need to send a weather balloon across America. They got 300 satellites orbiting the earth right now. We got the capability. Clinton gave them the capability when he was president. that They can zero in on you and they can read the tags on your car right now. TikTok is one of the most damning things young people can deal with or adults and TikTok is a China app and it is a data gathering app stay away from it take it off of anything you've got and people go nuts over TikTok and they have no clue what is going on because we have raised a generation that has no ability to think. And then how does God get into it? God, because they had because they love the lie and not the truth in the book of Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, God's going to send a delusion. And folks, and that's what we're living in now. A delusion. And for a child of God, and you may think this is not important to you. I don't care if you're old or young. This is important. You had better know God's word. Go to Matthew 24. Let's start there tonight. Matthew 24. The more I study the word of God, again, the more this chapter becomes very, very, didn't lock my wheel. Very important to me. It's a chapter that you need to know. It's a chapter you need to lay hold of. In 
in chapter 24 of Matthew, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See you not all these things? This is what Jesus is saying. Jesus said unto them, Do you see all of the all of the beauty of this temple? Now he's not going to use the word beauty. He don't call it the Herodian temple. And it was the Herodian temple. But he says, Do you see it? Do you see it? And this chapter is going to be a pro prophetic chapter. And Jesus is going to pre preach the prophetic message. And Jesus said unto them, Seek ye not all these things. Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here. Uh, well, let's go back to verse 1 because I want to pick up again. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things. And verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now that's going to take place in 70 A.D. by Titus, the Roman general. Christ is going to be crucified 33, 34 A.D. So he's telling, he's giving prophecy. Verse 3, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, and so he's sitting on the Mount of Olives, and you can look down at the Temple Mount or what's called Mount Moriah in the Old Testament. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be? Now, they don't know it's going to be Titus, and they don't know it's going to be in 70 A.D. But they're asking the Lord, tell us when it's going to be. They're going to ask him three questions. And he's going to say, or they're going to say, tell us when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world or that Greek word aeon, age. So they're looking too. And they're looking down the road too. But they don't know. Jesus knows. And Jesus answered and said unto them. Now this is when he begins his prophetic message. Take heed that no man deceive you. This is the deal. I can't be deceived. Folks, you might stand in the room and be all alone. You might be the only one in your neighborhood. You might be the only one in the town of Farmville. But you better be careful. Don't let no man deceive you. How are you going to do that? How are you going to keep that from happening? You're going to have to know the word of God. You've got to be a student of God's word. And let me tell you something. I've been in church all my life. I've heard that statement 5,000 times. No, minute, no telling how many times. But I'm telling you now, it's a very important statement. You better become a student of God's word. You better give your heart and attention to the teaching of God's word. I have come to the point in my, in my studies and in my teaching. Do I listen to certain preachers? Yes. I don't read as, I, don't, I read all the time, but I don't read books nearly like I used to. Because I've come to a point, I got to know God's word. I've got to understand, I, I want to know Greek. I want to know the tenses. Hebrew's a little different. I've never had much experience studying Hebrew. And even the other night, I started, and then I thought better, I'm going to bring my Greek Bible, and I am going to seek to teach out of it. Literally out of it. To give the literal 
translation. I thought you might not better go that route yet. And I probably won't. But deception, that's going to be the final tool of Satan. And it is going to be the final tool of man to bring himself, so he thinks, to Godhood. I can be greater than God. And folks, listen. We have got it. People that worship Lucifer publicly now, openly now, there is a room in the UN dedicated to Lucifer, and you can go in and meditate and study on Lucifer. Wickedness is deep. I'm telling you, we had better be careful of this new consciousness because it's going to bring me to, it wants to bring me to Godhood and it's going to be in things that unless I know God's word, I am not going to see it. Ashbury College. I thought there was something about this school I knew, knew. and I did. I didn't. I, it didn't. And I didn't come to it until Monday afternoon. And I had. Want, I kept trying to get it in my head. Monday afternoon, I came to it. There had been a study at several colleges that had started out with good foundation and had fallen away. This is one of the schools. It's a Wesleyan school, was Wesleyan, it's non-denomination now, with a Pentecostal background. And you can't accuse, uh, you can't take Wesleyan and Pentecostal and put them together. You can't say, well, John Wesley was a Pentecostalist. He wasn't. And Pentecostalism, 50, 75 years ago, is not what it is today. It's charismatic movement. It's entirely different. You've got to know your history about it or you don't, you don't get it. But Asbury College, now the faculty has stepped in, and as of today, they're going to limit who comes on campus. They're going to limit prayer time. They're going to limit testimony time. So if this is a revival, how in the world is man to control what only God can bring? And what did we note Sunday? Little preaching. So I can stop pretty much and come to an understanding. This is not this is not true biblical revival. And now they're wanting it to spread to other schools. In other words, they're trying to control it. Well, I got news for you folks. You can't control God's work. If it's a revival, they can't control it. But here's a, and you're gonna, and you're gonna you're gonna think I'm a nut. But here comes our new consciousness, our new self. We can control what God does and does not do. And we can give the facade that it looks godly. But when we crack open the egg, there's no yolk in it. There's no reality to it. There's no absolute to it. And folks, here's the word. Feeling. Oh, how I feel. And the emotion of it. If this is what I got to hang my hat on, God help me. And the, and, and the Lord said, let no man deceive you. You got it. And you got it. And what does he say in 1 John? He takes it further than that. He says, test the spirits and see whether it be true or not. There's another statement that God says, and this is a tender statement, greater 
is he within you. You see this word within you? Than which is in the world. Only God is greater than the world. And one or two is going to be in my heart. It's going to be God or it's going to be the world. You're going to have to give your life to Christ. Full-fledged, wholeheartedly, and you're going to have to stay in the Word of God. And you're going to have to pray through the many things that come to your life. And as a little church, we got a lot of things that are affecting the lives of our people. People who watch us over the Internet, they got a lot of things in their life and God's going to be our only hope so Jesus is warning let me quickly go on for many verse 5 for many shall come in my name saying I am Christ and shall deceive many many are going to go follow after see I'm telling you folks I deal with 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 things and people I read where people if I'm telling you if they say the word God they flip out. They think it's the most wonderful thing in the world. And I'm going to be honest with you. You call me what you want. You label us. Now, I, that's fine by me. Labels are okay. I don't have a problem with it. But I'm going to tell you right now. When I hear the word God, I cringe. Because I know the first thing I do is dissect this thing. And that's what you better do. He said, but preach a family. Family don't own you. My job. Your job don't own you. Well, preach, I'll be isolated. Okay, be isolated. You'll be all right. If it's you and God, you'll be fine. And you cannot allow your mind to take over your soul with thought and imaginations and this self-consciousness. And you're going to be saying, well, preacher, you've talked about the mind and the heart and the conscious. They're closely related. They are. But I got to keep the mind in the biblical context. Let this mind be in you. Whose mind? Christ's mind. Greater is he Greater is he within you than he that is in the world. Who is this greater? The Holy Spirit. I can't allow my mind to get away from me. I can't come to this self-consciousness. Oh, I'll be all right. I can handle this. I don't need God. You, that, that statement proves you do need God. And not only that, that statement proves you need to repent of what you just said and probably what you've just done. And the Lord goes on, and I can't take all the chapter, but let me go on. And you shall hear of, <clears throat> and remember, you're going to say, <clears throat> Preacher, how are, we, how are we going to mute Matthew 24? Well, we're going to mute back Matthew 24 from around <clears throat> 33, 30, let's just say, Jesus' public ministry was, 33, was three years, three and a half years. This is where I've got to pick up with this sermon. Close to the end of his earthly ministry. So there's a lot of you. I'm 2,000 miles. I'm 2,000 miles. I'm 2,000 years from that, from this past, from this sermon that our Lord preached. A lot of things have happened. And so we, we like to keep it in the present day context. And that's true. But I got to keep also in, in mind that Matthew didn't write, think Matthew wrote in 58 AD. Let me double check. He wrote 50, he wrote in 50 A.D., so at best, he wrote 17 years after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Well, a lot of things have transpired, and so the Lord's going to say in verse 6 of chapter 24, and you shall hear wars and rumors of wars. How many rumors of wars and wars have been since the day of Christ? A bunch of them. And folks, what war changed the paradigm? World War One, And what enhanced 
the next paradigm in the world. World War II. And World War II. Two things did not happen. And I've been studying this of late. And giving some attention to it. I want to be careful with this. Germany, in a sense, did not lose the war. And London did not win the war. Churchill made a statement, and I've always admired Churchill, but there's some statements he's made of late that have, have concerned me when he made them. When the United States were bom was bombed by Pearl Harbor and we got into World War II, Winston Churchill made the statement, we're going to be fine, we're going to be all right, we've got the United States on our side. And technically, from the Revolutionary War even to this hour, there has been an underground work to keep England the power of the world. At one time, the sun technically never went down on England because they occupied so many places. And when Nazi Germany did fall, they instituted a program called Paperclip. And they brought all of the academics and doctors. And these were brilliant men through Argentina into America and got them into colleges and institutions. You can read on it. The Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, they were involved in it. And they've been working toward this new consciousness ever since. And now they have gone public with that. They don't hide it. And Jesus goes on. And he deals again, verse 11, And many prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because of this, because of this iniquity, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But, verse 13, this very important, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. He talks about great tribulation in verse 21. He's going to take us through history and even if it were not for Christ, even the elect would be deceived. And even the great tribulation is going to have to be cut short or mankind will completely destroy himself. Verse 23 and 24, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there believe it not, for there shall arise false Christ, false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders. Folks, they're going to show great signs and wonders. And they're going to catch the eye of many people. They're going to capture the heart of many people. This is why you can't be watching. you got to be studying. you got to be walking with God. And folks, let me tell you something. Satan will do anything he can to destroy your faith. In Christ. And I don't care if you're an old man like me or you like some of our young people. Satan wants to destroy your faith. You can't allow him to do that. You can't allow him to get into your mind. You've got to stay away from certain things. And I'm telling you, one of the most dumbest things that we can do, and I use that word, I, I don't mean to be rude is to believe I can handle it. Now, folks, you're talking to the con artist now. When I was young, it didn't bother me to lie, and it didn't bother me to sell my mom and daddy a bill of goods. 
Not so much Oscar, my dad, but I could sure sell Van Etta bill of goods. And to my sorrow and to my shame today, I don't brag about it. And I do hesitate even telling it. But I do sometimes think in my preaching, okay, you got you got to kind of tell where you've come from. Because I know your struggles. I know the difficulty. And I know what a deception it is. And folks, Christ is going to come back. I don't have an hour. I don't have a day. I don't have a year. I don't have a month. But how is he going to find us living for him? And what is our mind going to be like? Now, I want to take you to several, what time is it? Take you two, three quick passages. I promise we'll be done. I was going to take you to Colossians. Well, let's, let's start by Colossians 1 because we're on our way to the book of James. Colossians. And we won't finish tonight, but that's okay. Colossians 1. Because I wanted to deal with Jesus Christ being the creator. But I'm not going to be able to do that tonight. But I do want to come to Colossians chapter 1 verse 21. And you who that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind. By or through wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So what is Paul warning us? My mind. When I was alienated, separated, a foreigner, an enemy of God, how? In my mind. Why? Because what it produced? Wicked works. Go with me to James chapter 1. I want to touch this tonight because I think this is becoming a great, great, great burden in the lives of Christians. There's a word, there's two words that are mentioned here in verse 8. A double Minded man. Literally, that in the Greek means two soul or two souled as an individual. You got you're living like you got two souls. You're double minded. And what does God say about a double minded man? He's unstable. In all of his ways. You can't count on him. And God can't count on him. And he actually has no faith. He has no faith. And he's not a God. You better make sure. You're as single minded. As you can be. Toward the things of God. Because this is what's going to get you through. Single minded in the things of the Lord. And then, as Philippians tells us, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Can I have the mind of Christ? I can. And I've got to by faith. I call you to Isaiah, and we are done. Isaiah 26. I have quoted this passage many, many times to my heart. Verse 3. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind 
he has stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. How does my mind stay on the things of Christ? I'm trusting him. I might not understand it all. I might not know it all. I might not can unpack it all. But I got to keep my mind on Christ. Trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. I might not can do it within myself. But I can do it through Christ. And he's got to be in a pure vessel. And remember, greater is he within you than he that is in the world. And our only hope, and what is the reason of our hope that lies within us? Jesus Christ. And may God help us tonight. Brother Scott, will you dismiss us in a word of prayer?